This video is going to go over the review for exam number two. This is for a, the Nolan and Heinzen book for Dr. Buchanan's Psych 200 class. Um, so what we're going to do is talk about the answers to this and I'm going to work them out for you. So the first example uh, gives you the basic overview of what's going on. So a researcher wants to know if their flashcard program is working and getting uh, the number of cards increased so that students can do better on tests. In general, people can memorize about 50 items with a standard deviation of 10. So anytime it says in general, that's going to be mu. And standard deviation is going to be sigma. Um, our researchers tested 25 people, so that's n. And their average score here, that's the sample mean, 54.05, or 54.5. And we're going to use 0.05 for all these different um, pieces of this review. So the first question is really from chapter 5. And it asks, what's the population of interest? Well, if I back up and look at this slide, essentially I know that we're interested in students in general, or people in general really, because I want to know if I can help individuals learn better. So the answer to this one's pretty easy. It's all people, because we're trying to make people um, memorize information easier. So second question, still from chapter five, why would I choose to assess a sample rather than a population? Well, often it's because we don't have access to the entire population. So I don't have access to everybody, um, obviously. Uh, ethical reasons might be another one. I'm not really in this study, but I can't force people to be in my study, nor can I give them cancer from doing that sort of research. Uh, it is faster and easier to sample than to collect everybody, and it's definitely cheaper, especially if you're having to pay subjects to sample. And then, uh, last but not least, is kind of the overall reason why you sample, is because we're just going to estimate the population with that sample. So these are all a bunch of different reasons why might I sample rather than try and collect everybody. Uh, and this one is the big one, that I don't have access to everyone in the population. Okay. Is random selection possible? Okay, this is still chapter five. Um, and so that's nah, a big no. I am sampling everyone, so I don't have access to them all. I don't have access to the entire population. Right. And so random selection would not be possible in, in this particular example, and I probably couldn't randomly assign them either. All right, now we're going to get into the information from Chapter 6. So in Chapter 6, we're really talking about uh, z-scores, or we're talking about one person at a time. which means that I don't want to do this as a z-test where we're doing multiple people at a time. Okay, so we're going to list percentages. So what percentage of students um, would score between a raw score of 50 and a raw score of 53? So I'm going to write down the numbers I have. So mu is 50 and sigma is 10. And those are the numbers I need for this particular example because I'm only talking about um, scores and not just um, and not a z test where I'm using samples of people. So the first thing you would do is calculate z. So z would be 50 minus 50, because okay, remember the formula here is mean minus mu divided by sigma. Um, and so I want to use the, um, I'm sorry, it's not mean. I just said this was a z score. It's person score minus mu divided by sigma, and each one of these is an x. Um, I don't want to use the sample mean information because um, I'm working with one set of scores. And so divide by 10. So the first person score is a 0. Now the second score is 53 minus 10. Oops, not 10. We want to use the population mean, so 50 divided by 10, okay. and that is a 0.3. Okay. 
So we're looking for the percent of people who are between 0 and 0 0.3. Um, so I'm going to draw that over here. Okay, so 0 here and then 0.3. So you want to go to a Z table or Z distribution table and look up the percent between 0 and 0.3. And I've already done that, so I'm going to go 50 and then the scores between 0 and 0.3 are 11.79, so that's here, and 38.21. So you're going to want to use a z-score table for that, and this is going to be the one that's the mean to z, and so I want to use the middle piece here, 11.79. <clears throat> And so the question is, what percentage of students have scores between? So that means we want to get this area here. And so I have, the answer is going to be 11.79 to this particular problem because I want to know the scores between. <clears throat> so the next question is, still from chapter 6, if I wanted to implement a learning assistance program to get the bottom 20% of people, what would the raw scores, that's X, uh, be for that program? And so we use this kind of thing a lot when we're trying to figure out who do we need to target for learning assistant programs, or alternatively, who do we target for gifted programs? So the first thing you want to do is find Z. And so I want to find where Z is at, where this is 50% the tail over here is 20% and this is 30. So you're looking for a score on a Z distribution table where the split is for 20 and 30. But remember this is the bottom 20%. So this is going to be a negative number. If you look that up, it's negative 0.84. Um, because remember when you're looking at a Z table and it's on the negative side, this 30 is going to be the second column because it's the mean to Z and the 20 is going to be the piece out here in the tail. So we need a negative 0.84 as our z. Step two is convert to x. Okay. And so that formula is x equals z times sigma plus the population mean. Remember that sigma in our examples on all of these is 10 plus the population mean is going to be 50. So I'm going to plug in my numbers here, so negative 0.84 times 10 plus 50, and that equals 41.6. Okay. And so the question to ask yourself is the bottom 20%. So the bottom 20% has got to be a negative number. Uh, not a negative number, I'm sorry, that's this part, it is negative. But the bottom 20 needs to be lower than the middle. And so if the, the population mean is 50, this score needs to be lower than that. And it is. So that gives us a good indication that we're headed in the right direction. Okay. And so those are examples of how you would calculate uh, using Z scores. So I'm looking at one person at a time, or I'm finding percentiles, that sort of thing. But if we move on to chapter 7, we're going to end up talking about hypothesis testing. So with hypothesis testing, I want to talk about the whole sample, everybody. Okay. And so what did you want to do in step one is write down the assumptions. Okay. So first assumption is always that the DV is scale. Okay. So this is a, a memory experiment, essentially. So how many items can I remember? Um, and so that makes it ratio. So I would say, yes, the DV is scale. Can we have random selection? Well, I've actually already asked you this question. And we decided the answer was no. I can't. I don't have access to everybody. <clears throat> For the next question, is it normal? Okay. Well, normal distributions, you have to tell people it's normal or have n greater than 30. In this example, n is 25, so we're pretty close. Um, it's not 100% normal. We can't assume that it's normal or assume a robustness of normal distributions, but it's pretty close. Okay. And then this example is a z distribution. Okay. 
Now, the next couple of steps of hypothesis testing, let's go on a new slide here, <clears throat> um, are to actually work out the problem. So step two, uh, part of step one and blended into step two is to list the sample and the population. So I'm going to list the sample here and the population over here. And so who's our sample? Well, who did we test? We tested this new flashcard program. So we've got flashcards versus no flashcards. Okay. And then one thing to do, I'm going to write it twice here for my null, is to think about what's the DV. So it's really tempting to um, write it's flashcards versus memory here. Uh, because people think about the, what is the dependent variable. So you might as well just list out here that the DV is the number of items remembered. It is a separate thing from list your sample and your population. So we are measuring people who are in the flashcard group against people who are in the no flashcard group. What are we measuring them on? Well, that's the DV, the number of items remembered. So don't, when you're writing these out, put that it's flashcards versus the DV. So don't do IV versus DV. Um, that is going to be in a different chapter. Okay, so we've got flashcards versus no flashcards. From the original problem, I said that I thought the flashcards were going to do better. Um, so the question was, uh, can we increase the number of items? And so that means that this automatically has to be less than or equal to. So whatever you pick here, is going to alter step four. So if I'm talking about my cutoff score, give myself some more space here. <clears throat> what we're doing is essentially setting up for a positive one-tailed test out here. Okay. Um, because I have said I only am caring if it's greater than. If it's less than, I don't care because that's bad and uh, I would reject I would fail to reject anyway. Step three is to list all the numbers you have. So I have a mean of 54.5. I have a sample of 25 students. Okay. I have a population mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10, but I need the standard error. So I'm going to calculate that. And so standard error is standard deviation divided by the square root of n, which is 25. That makes the whole thing 2. So we've got 10 over the square root of 25, which is 2. Remember the formula is um, standard deviation, so 10 divided by square root of n. And you will get that formula sheet on the test. Okay. For my cutoff score here, it's got to be positive. It's going to be one-tailed. And then from the original part of the problem, I said p less than 0.05, which makes it 1.64. Okay. So be sure you've got all four, uh, all of those combinations memorized. So uh, a one-tailed test at 0.05 is 1.64. A one-tailed test at 0.01 is 2.33. The two-tailed tests are plus and minus 1.96 for 0.05 and 2.58 for 0.01. Okay. <clears throat> the next step is my actual Z. I'm going to call it Z found to help keep myself straight here. So what's the real score? I got 54.5 minus, oh, come on now, <clears throat> 50 divided by 2. So it is um, mean minus population mean divided by standard error. I've got 2.25 and what would I do? It's really excited about confidence intervals <laughs> so I would reject the null <clears throat> because 2.25 is further out than 1.64 and so I would reject the null and say that these are different things. The flashcard program increases the number of items remembered over the no flashcard program. So flashcards better than no flashcards. And we're rejecting the null 
because it is in the critical region out here in the scribbles, uh, which means that our little car is trying to cross the finish line of 1.64, and it did because it got all the way to 2.25. Okay. So that would be the six steps of hypothesis testing. The next question um, is really where chapter eight comes in, and we're trying to find the uh, confidence interval for the mean. So often this is listed as uh, the point estimate. So what's the confidence interval around the point estimate? Well, um, when you say point estimate, we're always talking about the sample mean. So just a reminder, you create confidence intervals around samples. So the sample mean is going to be 54.5. I have to come up with Z critical. Remember, this is not Z found. So when we're looking at this problem, we found a Z of 2.25, but we don't want to use that in confidence intervals. What we want to do is use a Z cutoff score, Z critical. And Z critical always needs to be two-tailed. Um, <clears throat> so we want to come up with a two-tailed Z critical score for a 95% confidence interval. Why is it 95%? Well, we're using P less than 0.05, which automatically makes it a 95% CI. So it's plus M minus 1.96. And the other thing we need to calculate these is standard error, which we got as two in the last example. So the lower side is negative 1.96 times two plus 54.5. And then the upper side is positive 1.96 times 2 plus 54.5. And that formula is Z critical times standard error plus sample mean. <clears throat> and so what numbers I get when I do the math on this is 50, 58, and then 58, 42. And the question to ask yourself when you get to this confidence interval question is, um, is the lower limit actually lower than the sample mean? And yes, 50 is less than 54. Is the upper limit greater than the sample mean? Yes, 54 is greater than 58. And then do they make sense? Are they approximately the same around each side? So it's about four points up and four points down. So confidence intervals are equal on each side, and the lower one does need to be lower, and the upper one needs to be upper. Okay. Now if you remember, the population mean was 50. And so our population mean is not in that interval. It is outside the interval, which means we're likely to reject the null. Okay. So what's the effect size? So effect size is mean minus mu divided by standard deviation. Because remember, z is mean minus mu divided by standard error. So they have different denominators. So they are not equal to each other. If you get that d and z are the same, you've done one of them wrong. So that would be 54.5 minus 50 divided by 10. So it's 0.45. That is close to a medium effect size. So 0.2 is small, 0.5 is medium, 0.8 is large. So I would probably say it's a small medium effect size. Okay. And then the dreaded question from chapter eight, what is the power of this experiment? Okay. And so with power, the first step is to always write down what are all the numbers I have? So I have a mean, a population mean of 50, a standard deviation of 10, which means we need standard error. Sample size is 25. Uh, sample mean is 54.5. And standard error, remember we talked about, is 10 over the square root of 25, which is 2. And so what do we want to do? The next step is to decide which way you're going. So I want to use a greater than test because that was the thing we did Oop, too far. Chill out. There we go. So we want we did a greater than test here. So I want to do that again. So I'm going to say greater than test. So 
This word is terrible. Let's just try it again. So we've got greater than out here. <clears throat> and we're going to use 0.05 because that's what I said to use. So that's going to be positive 1.64 for Z. And um, you can do two tail comp uh, power examples, but they're rather difficult and we're only going to focus on one tail so you get the idea of what's going on. So I want to know what kind of score I need for a greater than test. So the first thing you want to do is calculate what is the mean that I would have needed to reject the null for my greater than test. So we're going to take z from the thing I just wrote down, time standard error plus the population mean. And so that's generally where people mess up if they mess up on power, is they plug in the sample mean first. So this is a plus the population mean, because what score do I need on the population to be able to reject the null? Okay. Let me erase my curve here so I have a little more room. So if I plug that in, it's 1.64 times 2 plus 50. Okay. So my mean needed is 53.28. I have a mean of 54, so I'm doing good. This is a greater than test. If I needed at least a 53 and I have 54, I have done better than I expected. Okay. So the next step is to calculate the Z difference between what I would have needed and what I have. Okay, so this is a weird formula. I'm going to take mean needed and stick it here. Minus the mean I have divided by standard error. So that is the difference score between what I need and what I have. So that's 53.28 minus 54.5 divided by 2, which is a z of negative 0.61. So I'm going to take that negative 0.61 okay, and calculate how far I got. Okay. So I'm going to kind of do that, erase this thing. So I have some room, didn't give myself enough slides here. So I got a negative 0.61 for Z. There we go. And so I got negative 0.61 down here. That's the zero line. So everything over here is 50%. You would go look up a Z chart and look up the um, what the numbers were for this one. So you got 2709 and 2291 on a Z chart for 0.61 and since it's negative remember this is the middle column this number here is the middle column and this number is out here on the tail it's a greater than test so I want to go to the right which is where greater is and so I would add together 22.91 and 50 so I've got Z or not Z let's say power is 72.91 because it's 50 plus 22 and that is not good for us remember we want power to be at least 80 so we don't quite have the power we needed but we were able to reject the null okay <clears throat> all right so the next question is going to be another example of power because that's pe people typically struggle with on this test and so i have n is 15 so, and then we're also trying to find a decrease. So we're treating depression and we want depression scores to go down because that just makes sense. We want people to be healthier. And so they give the drug to 15 people. They have them take the BDI and they give you the general scores for the BDI. So this is mu with standard deviation of five. Shwink. And the new people on this drug have a mean of 12. And then how much power did it have at a different level here? 0.01. So let's try this problem. First thing to do, write down the numbers you have. So n is 15. Uh, population mean is 18. Sigma is 5. Um, the mean is 12. And that makes standard error. 5 over the square root of 15, which is 1.29. Then you want to calculate mean needed. 
So our mean needed is going to be uh, Z critical. So I gotta figure that one out first. So Z critical, it's gonna be a less than test and it's 0 0.01, so that makes it a negative 0.233. So I mean needed is going to be Z critical, 2.33 times um, standard error, which we said was 1.29, plus the population mean, which is 18. <clears throat> so I'm going to figure out the mean that I needed. So this is basically the same formula. It's not basically. It is the same formula as converting from Z to X. But we're working with samples, so we have to use sigma m or a standard error. And so this is the formula of how, what is the score I would have needed to reject the null? If you do all that math, it's 1499. So I have a 1499, or I need a 1499, and I have 12. So I'm doing pretty good because remember it's a less than test. So I want my score to be less than that. Um, and so I would have needed 15 points and I have 12. So the next thing you want to do is calculate the Z difference. So that score goes here, so 14.99 minus M, so the sample mean, what I actually have, divided by 1.29, so standard error, and I get 2.32, which is kind of a big number to get on power. And then what I want to do is plot that. So I've got 50% of the data over here because this is zero. And then my score is 2.32. Oh, here, let me write this underneath so it stays clear what's going on. So 2.32. And if you look up 2.32 on a Z table, you have 1.02 in the tail and 48.98 here in the mean to Z. Okay, so remember on the positive side, uh, this one is the one in the middle, this one is the one on the in the tail. Okay. Now, I want a less than test here. So I need to go this way. Because it's less than, remember left than is to the left. So I would add together 50 plus 48.98. So I get the power is 98.98. And that's great for me. That means I have a n almost 99% chance of rejecting the null when there's truly a difference between the means. So remember the definition for power is the probability of rejecting the null when there truly is a difference. And so that concludes the exam two review. If you're still struggling, you can go and watch the chapter seven and eight examples where I'll cover more of these uh, types of problems.